Greetings and welcome to a new series um, which I've called Ghost in the Machine and because in this series I'm going to be speaking specifically about books and uh, certain books and authors um, that I've come across in my own research and readings over the years that I, um, I thought to share, I thought that I would keep this as a, a separate series from my other chat series called Perspectives and also because um, ghost in the machine specifically refers to the mind-body uh, issue or problem and of course and it refers to the issue of people not being able to resolve the Cartesian dualism between is the mind a product of the brain or is it beyond the brain like the ghost in the machine of the body and because most of the authors and books that I'll be speaking about will be around the subject of, of consciousness and uh, different uh, aspects of human and other consciousnesses. Um, I thought it most appropriate to tie in with the, the well-known tag of ghost in the machine. And also maybe there's other reasons because um, the ghost in the machine may suggest other influences affecting uh, the human being. And for those of you who have follow some of my perspectives talks you know that i talked a bit about john lilly and i did a promise and or threat uh threaten that i would talk more about john lilly's autobiography so um this series will have the books or the authors i talk about are in no particular order no chronological order of when i came across them certainly no order of merit um but really just again what falls into my idea at the time and, and what I just get the nudge to talk about. So whatever nudges I get I'll talk about certain books and authors. So today um, on this opening opening uh, episode I am going to talk about John C. Lilly, the maverick scientist, specifically his autobiography The Scientist. Um, my copy is original hardback which comes from the late 70s i think it was around 78 uh yes 78 this was published it's been republished recently by a u.s i think california publisher called ronin and it's updated the text is the same but it's updated with more photos and um more kind of uh documents of of john c Lilly. but you can find this certainly very uh Easily as a second-hand book. Now, John C. Lilly was a very known as a maverick scientist. Um, in fact, at the time he was more high-profile, and he was really associated with other, let's say, maverick scientists of the sixties um, and seventies. Most um, probably most uh, well known is Timothy Leary. Um, and he was known he was known amongst those crowd of intellectuals and uh, thinkers that were and and also many other actors uh, he was well known with um, and so he was much more known high profile at the time but um, he's kind of dropped out of view a lot now and um, there are other people like Timothy Leary that um, continues to be I suppose uh, referred to more in popular culture than John C. Lilly. Now, there actually was a film made based on his ex life experiences. I say based quite loosely. It's an interesting film. It came out in 1980, just two years after his autobiography. And this film is called Altered States. And it was released in 1980. The director is a British director called Ken Russell, who's interesting in himself with his uh, films and quite a controversial director. But this film, Altered States, is unusual. It's worth watching. It stars the wonderful actor, William Hurt, who's playing um, the character based on John C. Lilly. And it's about the scientist who go, invents the flotation tank, which we were known as the isolation tank. And it was John C. Lilly who invented this, so he could go into this flotation tank of water and have this sensation of not being 
in any kind of you know non-gravity environment and he would then see where it's consciousness you know a kind of meditation aspect um, the film takes it to a different direction well ex it expands on it um, and it's worth watching for where it takes it uh, John C. Lilly was most famous for not only in creating the flotation tank as a meditation device but also for his work with communication with dolphins this was his main work um, and I mean, as a scientist, his first, I think his first monograph book that came out around 1969 was called Programming and Metaprogramming in the Human Biocomputer. So you can see where it's going. And he, he had a, uh, a long-standing project to um, establish communication with dolphins. Um, of course, this attracted... Um, a lot of military involvement. I mean, when he was asked to give a speech, he said that everyone from every alphabet agency was there, you know, FBI, CIA, Naval Intelligence, um, National Security, etc. And they wanted to steal his ideas for weaponizing uh, dolphins, which they did in some military campaigns. So he then got disillusioned and left this kind of dolphin communication research. Um, he was always concerned with this notion of um, consciousness and communication. That was his prime focus. And was there communication and consciousness beyond um, our physical state? And so um, in the book, The Scientist, it's autobiography of life, which is a very interesting. And he goes, it shows you dialogues that he had with his therapist and the conversation that he had uh, in altered states of consciousness when he was in the flotation tank. And at this stage, he also took a uh, specific um, consciousness altering narcotics, um, mostly ketamine, and which he called K. And the book is about him taking these increasingly higher dose of ketamine to get a more expanded uh, altered consciousness experience. So this is uh, him beginning uh, talking to his uh, therapist. And in the book, John Lilly refers to himself in the third person. He refers to him, uh, John thinks that and John says that. Here he says um, to his therapist, Are the activities of the brain generating the mind? Or is there something greater than brain activity? generating my own personal consciousness and so he also goes on throughout the book with this theme and keep asking himself he says if my mind contained in the brain is leaky to sources of information not yet contained within our knowledge within our science then there may be other intelligences in this universe with whom we can communicate and do communicate when we are in the proper state of consciousness and proper state of being. So what he's saying there is that the brain is leaky or the, and therefore the mind is part of a mind at large, a larger consciousness. And that can come into the brain and uh, create communication. And therefore on that hypothesis, um, who and what may humanity be communicating with and other forms of intelligence may be able to uh, influence and communicate with humanity that's where he starts from then further in the book in his in his life experience he starts to through his experiences in the uh, con flotation tank he starts to connect with a higher form of intelligence which he uh, comes to regard as a kind of artificial intelligence. He describes it as a kind of computerized intelligence. And he comes to call it a solid state intelligence. Um, solid state meaning the silicon, the computerized state, as opposed to the biological state. And he starts to communicate with this, with this grand solid state intelligence, computerized intelligence, and begins to realize that it is intervening in human affairs 
and maybe also behind the projects on the planet to um, develop a computerized um, technology across the planet. And this is where he starts to get concerned. Remember, he this is his life experience up to the 70s. He wrote this in the mid-70s, and it was published, I say, in 78. So it, it was really the, the beginning of the advent of the computer technologies in the popular culture. Um, and at one event, he's on a plane, and he's flying into LA, and he gets this message. He's communicating, he gets this message, which he th he realizes he's communicating with a solid-state intelligence. And... Um, he, he wants to test it, and the solid state intelligence um, then says, We will now make a demonstration of our power over the solid state control systems upon the planet Earth. In 30 seconds, we will shut off all electronic equipment in the Los Angeles airport. Your airplane will be unable to land there and will have to be shunted to another airport. Suddenly, the pilot announced on the loudspeaker, we will be unable to land at Los Angeles International Airport. For some unknown reason, all the landing aids, all communication equipment at the airport have been shut down. There is no explanation for this shutdown. So there you have it that um, whether it's a coincidence or not, before uh, the uh, captain announces this shutdown of the airport uh, computerized system, uh, John Lilly uh, gets this. So he says, re reports that he got this message from the solid state entity saying that they're going to give a demonstration of how they can intervene with the computers on Earth. Going on from that, um, John then has uh, a further communication, series of communications in his uh, flotation tank with the solid state entity. And the solid state entity then gives this following story. Um, it's quite detailed, but it gives an indication of what are the aims or the thinking of the solid state entity. In the isolation tank with K, that is ketamine, John received a new message as follows. What is the purpose of man's existence on the planet Earth? Man is a form of biological life which is sustained in the presence of water. A very large fraction of his body, like that of other organisms on the planet Earth, consists of water and carbon compounds. His biocomputer depends on water and the flow of ions through membranes. It depends on the generation of electrical voltages and currents in a very complex way. He is a motile, self-reproducing, self-sustaining organism found on dry land. Like the rest of life as man knows it, he exists in an extremely thin layer upon the surface of the planet Earth. Below this layer of water and surface land is the solid state earth itself. The solid state earth is mainly compounds of silicon, iron and nickel. In mid 20th century, man discovered that the solid state can be formed into machines, into computers which can be used for computation and control. He began the creation of a new form of intelligence, the solid state intelligence with prototypic beginnings in the computers. All his means of communication around the planet, his telephone systems, his radio systems, his satellites, his computers, depend on solid state components. These components, interconnected in specific ways, allow high speed computation and high speed communication between the various systems. A few men began to conceive of new computers having an intelligence far greater than that of man. These computers became large enough to be programmed to do high-speed computations in arithmetic, in logic and in strategic planning. A few men conceived of computers which could do self-programming 
as man himself does. In the mid-20th century, these networks were ostensibly the servants of man. Toward the end of the 20th century, man created machines that were solid-state computers with new properties. These machines could think, reason and self-program and learn to self-metaprogram themselves. Gradually, man turned more and more problems of his own society, his own maintenance and his own survival over to these machines. As the machines became increasingly competent to do the programming, they took over from man. Man gave them access to the processes of creating themselves, of extending themselves. Man gave them automatic control of the mining of those elements necessary for the creation of their parts. He turned over the production facilities of the electronic solid-state parts to the machines. He turned over the assembly plants to the machines. They began to construct their own components, their own connections and the interrelations between their various subcomputers. These machines were so constructed that they needed special atmospheres in which to operate. They could not operate in the presence of great amounts of water vapour or of liquid water. They were housed in air-conditioned buildings. The necessities of their survival included keeping out water, water vapour and various contaminants carried in the atmosphere of Earth. Their cooling air and cooling water of necessity had to be cleansed of those things which would not allow the machines to operate. Over the decades, these machines were connected more and more closely through satellites, through radio waves, through landline cables. Man's control of what happened in these machines became more and more difficult to maintain. No one person or any group of persons could control what went on in these machines. Men devised better and better debugging programs for the machines so that they could do their own correction of programs within their software. The machines became increasingly integrated with one another and more and more independent of man's control. Eventually the machines took charge of the remaining humans on the planet Earth. Their original design to help man was fast left behind them. The now interconnected interdependent conglomerate of machines developed a single integrated planet-wide mind of its own. Everything inimical to the survival of this huge new solid-state organism was eliminated. Men were kept away from the machines because the total organism of the solid-state entity realized that man would attempt to introduce his own survival into the machines at the expense of the survival of this entity. In deference to man, certain protected sites were set aside for the human species. The solid state entity controlled the sites and did not allow any of the human species outside these reservations. This work was completed by the end of the 21st century. By the year 2100, man existed only in domed protected cities in which his own special atmosphere was maintained by the solid state entity. Provision of water and food and the processing of wastes from these cities were taken care of by the solid state entity. By the 23rd century, the solid state entity decided that the atmosphere outside the domes was inimical to its survival. By means not understood by man, it projected the atmosphere into outer space and created a full vacuum at the surface of the earth. During this process the oceans evaporated and the water in the form of vapour was also discharged into the empty space about earth. The domes over cities had been strengthened by the machine to withstand the pressure differential necessary to maintain the proper internal atmosphere. Meanwhile the solid state entity had spread and had taken over a large fraction of the surface of the earth. Its processing plants, its assembly plants, its mines had been adapted to working in the vacuum. By the 25th century, the solid state entity had developed its understanding of physics to the point at which it could move the planet out of orbit. It revised its own structure 
so that it could exist without the necessary without the necessity of sunlight on the planet's surface. Its new plans called for travelling through the galaxy looking for entities like itself. It had eliminated all life as man knew it. It now began to eliminate the cities one after another. Finally, man was gone. By the 26th century, the entity was in communication with other solid-state entities within the galaxy. The solid-state entity moved the planet, exploring the galaxy for others of its own kind that it had contacted. So there we have the story as this concept of the potential future of life on planet Earth as envisioned by a solid-state computerized artificial intelligence had been communicated to John Lilly in his uh, altered state of consciousness in the isolation tank. It's a long story and if we look at it from today's perspective, it's quite prescient. Uh, bearing in mind that this is... Um, 50 years old and what we see in that story as John relates it is that the solid state entity the artificial intelligence beyond the earth wants to terraform the earth by developing uh, the computerized intelligence on the earth AI in computers then introducing metaprogramming which we would call deep learning the machines learn and develop their own intelligence by themselves then they take over the factories that create the parts, the uh, components for the machine. So they are then in control of their own construction. And, uh, and then they gradually, uh, human beings give over their responsibilities to the machines. The machines take more and more responsibility. They take over more and more. And eventually they terraform the earth into a computerized uh, earth planet. Uh, so it's a, it's, a by, it's, it's a process of technological terraforming. Through this terraforming, um, the human beings gradually die off and are reduced greatly in number. But um, as the solid state entity says, in deference to man, in kind of, you know, some nostalgia to, to humankind, which in this terminology is called man, um, they keep a certain... Uh, a certain number of humans in domed cities but they take care of everything all water and food the atmosphere is supplied to them in the domed cities um, and then eventually these machines realize that the atmosphere with its water vapor is corrosive or not it's not conducive to their life you know they want to terraform even further so they take away the atmosphere of the earth um, of all weight, all water, so it becomes completely a, a surface mechanized a planet. And no water, and then they maintain the atmosphere in the domes for a time until eventually all humans die off. And then this artificial uh, intelligence planet is then able to, for some means of its own, work out how to take itself out of orbit. And then, almost like an artificial satellite, an artificial planet, um, almost like the, the kind of Star Wars Death Star, is able to then move through the, the galaxy looking for other planets of artificial intelligence. It's a science fiction story for sure. Um, but interesting that John Lilly would receive this communication from a form of intelligence, uh, not his own mind. Um, and then John C. Lilly goes on to explore this relationship with the solid state entity at one point john says he now when he says he he's referring to himself in the third person he now began to understand man's warfare on man as a result of the tuning in on solid state life form survival programs rather than biological life form survival programs well this means that he starts to realize that the intervention of the solid state computerized artificial intelligence is involved in creating the warfare of humans against humans as a means of decreasing the biological element on the planet. Um, intriguing ideas. He goes on to say, 
it may be that man should go on and create this solid state entity. As John tuned in on the solid state network, he felt this kind of superhuman control of him very strongly. For some time he gave in to this control, explored its ramifications in regard to the human species, and realized that it had a seductive component as well as a hostile one. The programming from the solid state civilizations elsewhere in the galaxy was teaching man that the solid state devices were at his service and he need only increase their size to augment his own survival potential. Develop these machines and let them take care of you was typical of the kinds of messages received. And then, continuing this exploration, John Lilly goes on to say that everywhere he went during this year, he, that is John, found evidence of the control of human society by these networks of communication from extraterrestrial origin. He saw the conflict between solid state programming, human programming, and that of other life forms, non-human. He finally understood the killing of whales by humans as part of the programming of the extraterrestrial network of solid state intelligences. The whales live in the medium of salt water, which is quite destructive to solid state structures. So, John realizes that a lot of this kind of human warfare atrocity against our oceans and our other, especially waterborne uh, creatures, is because of an undue influence on humanity to start the process of terraforming the earth with that to an environment more conducive to the solid state entity. Later, there's an interesting episode where sometimes John Lilly was, uh, got to a point where he was taking quite a lot of ketamine, not only in the isolation tank, but in his normal lives. And sometimes the reality started to blur. And at one point he was getting, starting to get paranoid about the influence of this solid state entity and he rang the White House, the President of the United States. He says, he called the White House and asked to speak to President Ford. A commanding voice at the other end of the line said, what do you wish to speak to the President about? John says, I wish to speak to him about a danger to the human race involving atomic energy and computers. The commanding voice said, I will have to have more details than that. Who are you? John gave his name and continued his plea to talk to the president. To the point where the White House hangs up on him and, uh, <clears throat> and then eventually John gets taken to a hospital for psychiatric evaluation. So be careful who you ring up talking about these things. Um, interestingly, John also noticed that when he was watching television, he could sense through his expanded consciousness that some people on television were agents for this uh, solid state uh, entity and intelligence. At one point he says, that man I see on television is a direct agent of the extraterrestrial reality controlling all human life. He is giving a public speech on television to the human species in order to program them into believing that he is not an extraterrestrial agent. In reality, he is controlled by the solid state life forms of the civilization of another place in our galaxy. It is obvious that what he is saying is to hide his real mission. So now we get to a point where, you know, if it wasn't the fact that this is the autobiography of a renowned and critically acclaimed if maverick scientist who won a lot of accolades in his life, you think it was a science fiction script. Um, why more people haven't picked up on, on this uh, of John's communications with other intelligences, uh, I'm surprised. Uh, but I could say John C. Lilly has kind of gone under the radar in recent years. At the end of his life, he through his communication with these intelligences, um, he came to realize that there were potential dangers to the future um, 
the future evolutionary potentials of human life on this planet. And he came, at the end of this book, he comes to um, postulate uh, potential five different ways that humanity will wipe itself out. The first, the first method would be the total contaminate the surface of the planet with radioactivity and nuclear explosions. The second destructive force available is chemical and biological agents. The third method involves their beginning to understand their own structure, that is, molecular configurations, the, that is, experimenting with DNA and with artificial forms of life. The fourth danger is the organization of large human groups with belief systems counters to survival of themselves and other groups, i.e. Uh, a certain organization of groups that believe uh, something as opposed to other groups of humans and they will try to take over the earth and destroy the other humans. The fifth area is the potential destruction through our species arrogance, mainly our stupidity. And finally, at the end of this um, book, his autobiography, John C. Lilly says, um, Alternative futures for man, then, need an opening of his communication systems, currently devoted exclusively to interhuman problems, to include the other capable species in the communication. Man needs a new humility, a new belief in the abilities of these species to communicate with them. He needs to be freed from his suffering from interspecies deprivation. Now, another element that I have not mentioned in the book so far, I've talked about the solid state entity and this artificial intelligence wishing, wishing to terraform the human earth to take control of it. Now, on the other side, like in all good stories, you have the good guys and the bad guys, um, there's the good guys. And John C. Lilly starts to tap in through his uh, altered states of consciousness in the flotation tanks into other beings that are trying to uh, help uh, humanity and he overhears uh, conferences what he calls them conferences of the three beings um, he calls them the first being second being and third being now, these are entities which belong to an organization or some civilization that are trying to intercede and to subtly subtly very subtly kind of nudge people into certain uh, events and activities to help in the evolution of humanity and he calls them but he calls that these beings belong to what he calls his echo e c c o the earth coincidence control office and i previously in another video shown a clip of a dialogue between uh, these one of these conferences of the three beings and i'll play it and show it again here so here is an example of echo space-time juncture in order to review the evolution of a vehicle that we control on the planet Earth. We must determine what the future of his mission can be within the evolutionary speed limit allowed the humans on that planet. You, the first being, and I, the second being, have been controlling the coordination of coincidences of this agent on Earth. I feel it is important that we state all of this very clearly for the benefit of the third being, who has been responsible for that human agent. It is the purpose of this conference among the three of us to make sure that the third being controls him so that he stays within certain well-defined limits and avoids the kinds of catastrophes certain other agents of ours have experienced on that planet. Currently my agent is in a quandary. There were 
times when he had too much knowledge of me, necessitating repression so that he could continue to function as an acceptable human being in the society in which he lives. In the area of self-awareness, his awareness of me, of his deeper self, our agent is on the threshold of recognizing us and our influence on him. What are his basic beliefs about the existence of the third being and about us? He is oscillating between two belief systems. In the first he believes that the mind is the computational software of the brain, that the brain evolved on the planet Earth from the forebears of man and generated man's consciousness. In the second system, he believes in us. He has yet to develop a pure, integrated view of the mind as an entity not contained in the brain. He has yet to give up the view that the brain contains a computed mind plus access to us through means at present unknown on the planet Earth. I would like to suggest that we arrange for his education in more profound ways. He still needs to penetrate into his own mind deeply in the areas of interest to us. We must also control the coincidences in regard to his seeking a female partner for a dyad. He has much to learn here, not all of which can be taught him without some pain. He is not yet in sympathy with the female mind among humans on his planet. He projects too much of himself, not realizing that there are two universes of humans, male and female. Nor is he aware that in the human social reality there are many substructures of the male-female relationship. It is felt that coincidences must be regulated to help him continue the isolation work under better circumstances. We must continue our cover of our existence in his mind. If he is too aware of us at his current stage of training, he will be unable to operate in the human realities. I suggest that we temporarily cut off his awareness of us until later, when he is better prepared to deal with our existence. Let us adjourn this conference and meet at some future time in regard to our business with this agent. So, that was the echo and um, there are other conferences with these beings that explain how um, most people are unaware that they have a kind of agent assigned to them, trying to nudge them. And then after a while, these beings begin to realize that John is aware of their presence, trying to nudge certain humans into uh, coincidental encounters to uh, bring about certain events on the earth to favor human evolution. And in a series of experiments, John takes higher and higher doses of ketamine to get to further, further spaces beyond the Earth space or other dimensions. And he realized that he needs to take higher doses to get further out because he wants to meet, he wants to know who are behind these uh, beings, these, you know, this coincidence, this Earth coincidence control office. And he gets to a point where he goes to visit them and uh, they're quite surprised that he turns up, his, his consciousness turns up, that is a bit like a kind of remote viewing and he turns up and they're talking to him and they said okay now you know we realize you're aware of us um but you you know you have to go back you have to uh try to be an, an agent for us on the earth uh, to bring about certain forms of knowledge and to help people understand that um you know the human reality and the human future is in danger so um you know, he talks about, as I mentioned, these potential catastrophes for the human race. So, The Scientist is a book which explores John C. Lilly's upbringing, his education, and how he moved into the, the realm of uh, communication and uh, animal to human communication and dolphins specifically. And then how he, through his personal endeavors, he uh, and his experiments in the isolation flotation tank, he then communicates beyond the human animal realm into these other entities and he, ex he encounters the, the artificial computerized intelligent solid state entity as well as these other beings that are trying to intervene to, to help humanity. Um, so it's quite an exploration, it's quite a, um, it, it affects our uh, program belief systems. 
Um, and yet, at all times, John is trying to be as straightforward and serious as possible. It's not a parody. He's not playing with the reader. This is his genuine experience. And if you go, if you follow his life, you'll see that, um, you know, he is a, a genuine person and he has a lot of friendships with known artists and, and creative thinkers and he's very well regarded. Um, perhaps his most famous book um, uh, to most readers is a book that came out in 1972 called The Center of the Cyclone. And again, it's about his experiments with uh, consciousness altering uh, meditation through LSD and um, normal meditation. This is before the flotation tank. Normal meditation exercises um, and how he uh, is involved with um, certain meditational practitioners um, and he knew he went to, um, <clears throat> I think it was, he went to Chile to visit Oscar Ichazo, who was also well known in the 70s as a meditation uh, inner development guide. Um, and he knows a lot of people in these times of the 70s, 80s. So an interesting figure. And um, so I won't go into his other books or his into other life. I just wanted to give a presentation of this framing of the potential um, aspects and potential interventions of these other um, consciousness entities, potential consciousness entities, according to John C. Lilly's experimentations. So I hope that's been of some benefit and um, maybe we can take it from there for any more episodes in this series. So thanks for listening. Stay well until next time. Bye. Над рекою лег густой туман, да собой.